Thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum. My name is Laura Wright. I am the Assistant Director for Metadata Production at Cornell University Library, and I'm the host for today's event. Our topic today, we have two topics today, actually. We have a demonstration and information about integrations with Folio's Codex and Archivum, as well as a roadmap update. This session, like all Folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Foundation's YouTube channel. As an open forum, participants can see each other and all questions submitted, and we've muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. Please use the question box within Zoom to enter questions and comments as they come to you, and I will ask them of our panelists. If you like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. We also encourage you to, to continue the discussion on this topic on the Folio Discussion website, which is discuss.folio.org. So we will have two presenters today, and we're going to ask if you have questions for either that you keep them for the very end after both presentations. Today's speakers are Matthew Addis of Archivum and Harry Kaplanian of EBSCO. And Matthew will be going first talking about integrating Archivum with Folio's Codex. So, Matthew. Brilliant. Thank you, Laura. Um, let me just share my uh, screen. Um, so, uh, I'm Matthew Addis. I'm CTO and co-founder of Archivum, um, and thanks for the opportunity to be able to talk to you guys. Um, this talk is about uh, Perpetua and Folio, um, so just let me put some slides up. Um, so Perpetua is a hosted software solution from Archivum. Uh, it's used for long-term data management of a wide range of digital content, um, and it helps make sure that that content remains accessible and usable for anyone who needs to use it in the future. Um, and we've got lots of customers who use Perpetua in the library space, uh, especially in higher education. And we've got a great partnership with EBSCO. So EBSCO suggested we have a go at integrating Perpetua into Folio. And we thought, well, why not? Let's give it a go. Um, and that's what this talk is about. So Perpetua is the first third party application that's been integrated into Folio. And the guys at EBSCO keep telling me to sort of really stress the first party um, bit. So I might just mention that once or twice as we go along. And the fact that Perpetua is the first third party app to be integrated into Folio makes it sound somehow like super complicated or, or a massive achievement. But actually it only took us a couple of weeks um, to go all the way through the process of Installing Folio, understanding the basics of how it works, plugging in Perpetua, and then producing a proof of concept. And that's what I'll do in a live demo in just a few minutes. Um, and the fact that we could do this so quickly, I think is a real testament to the benefits of Folio as an open source project with open APIs and open community um, and lots of good documentation and support. So Folio is a platform that's designed to make it easy to incorporate and use a wide range of apps. And we're certainly very happy to testify that that's actually the case. Um, so some more on that later too. Um, First of all, a little bit about uh, what Perpetua, Perpetua actually is. Um, so it's a, it's a hosted solution for making your digital content safe, secure, accessible, and usable for the long term. So breaking that down a little bit, um, safe means that digital content um, doesn't get corrupted or lost. Secure means that there's control over who can deposit, edit, or access that content. Um, Accessible means people can find it and use it um, when they need it. And usable means that people can actually open and render and use the content in the future, uh, even if it was originally created um, many years ago. And we do that for the long term, uh, which could be um, today, tomorrow, next week, next year, in a decade, or even in, per in perpetuity. Um, you know, we, we're a reasonably well-founded company. We've been going for a while. We've got lots of customers around the world. I, I won't dwell on, on the, the various stats. Um, to say a little bit more about, you know, Perpetua and how it works in practice, 
if you have digital content, so it could be born digital material, it could be digitized content, it could be um, stuff in catalogs or a records management system, then you can take that content, you can ingest it into Perpetua as a hosted solution. Um, so it's uploaded, um, checks take place, it's prepared, and then it goes through a digital preservation process. And that's where preservation policies and actions get applied. Um, and that does two things. It creates long-term preservation versions of the digital content, which along with the originals are safeguarded. So that means that we make multiple copies, store them in different geographic locations and fixity check them. But the preservation process also creates access copies or access versions of the content, which are um, easy to deliver and use over the web for a range of different purposes. And we allow that content also to be discovered. Um, first of all, we, you know, we've integrated with EBSCO's discovery service, um, and now we've integrated with, with Folio. Um, these are just a few examples of some of our um, customers who use Perpetua, so uh, libraries, university libraries, but also other organizations whose mission it is to provide long-term access to content, um, so museums, galleries, archives. Uh, and there's a few more, well, there's actually quite a lot more um, customers that we have that I haven't listed here, including in other sectors, um, such as life sciences and medical. Um, and we have a partnership with EBSCO, um, so if you're interested in Perpetua, uh, then we've got this partnership so you can find out more about Perpetua through them as well as directly from us. And, and really the rest of the slides that I've got before I delve into a, into a demonstration, um, try to emphasize um, the fact that we are um, really keen on open standards, open specifications and open source. Um, and that's important when dealing with solutions that provide very long-term preservation and access to digital content, and it's also well aligned to um, Folio. So, for example, we support the Open Archive Information System model, um, whereby producers of content that may come from a range of different content sources can be um, submitted to Perpetua, validated, preserved, safeguarded, um, and then made discoverable and accessible to various people who might need to use that content in the future. And Perpetua is the bit in the middle that supports um, the sort of workflows of taking content from a range of sources and delivering it out to people who need to use it um, uh, in the future. Uh, and to do that, we build on a range of open source um, technologies and open specifications. So for example, um, for special collections and archives, uh, we include access to memory, so that's A to M from Artifactual um, within the Perpetua solution. And for digital preservation, we use the Archivematica um, open source uh, digital preservation solution, um, also from Artifactual. Uh, we support things like metadata standards such as Dublin Core or ICA standards for archives, um, Mets and Premise, particularly for long-term preservation versions of content, um, and there's a whole load of sort of underpinning open source um, technologies we use within our solution. And that, that approach of being open um, extends to using Perpetua as part of open systems through open integrations um, and interoperability. So these are just some of the things that we integrate with uh, as sources of content that might be transferred into Perpetua as well as ways of discovering and using that content uh, in the future. So, so I can give you a couple of examples of, of what that means um, in practice. So here I'm showing um, the sort of typical workflows we might support for research data um, and scholarly output. So we integrate with things like ePrints and DSpace and Sanvera, as well as um, commercial solutions such as Figshare. And there, um, a researcher, for example, might interact with an institutional repository to um, upload their data and have it reviewed and approved maybe by someone in the library um, before it's published um, and a DOI gets minted and then it's made discoverable through a discovery service. And that's all a sort of a standard institutional repository workflow. But we've integrated Perpetua into that workflow so that when that data set 
is approved and published, then it's automatically transferred to Perpetua. Um, we create preservation versions of it, which are then replicated and stored in multiple locations. So the data is um, protected uh, and sort of we create long-term versions of it that are held in addition to and independently of the institutional repository. And that's a fully automated process. The other example, and that's particularly relevant to what I want to show for the integration that we've done with Folio, is the support that we have for special collections and archives. So here, the workflow is a little bit different. Um, we integrate with things like um, Archive Space and Calm and, um, and other things you might not have heard of, like Apexio, as well as including um, A2M within our solution. So here you might have, for example, someone in the library who's been digitizing manuscripts um, and they are uploading the images uh, into Perpetua. Uh, there might be uh, a catalog record for that uh, item that might be imported from a collection management system or an archive information management system. And then someone within the library, for example, an archivist, might review and approve that content that's been uploaded and imported. They might um, uh, set some form of digital preservation policy and then Perpetua using Archive Massacre will generate both a preservation version of that content, which is replicated and safely stored, but also an access version of that content, which is transferred, well, it could be to many places. It could be to um, Atom, uh, as part of Perpetua, it could be to somewhere like Archive Space, um, and we have an integration with Archive Space for um, uh, University of Colorado Boulder, um, where Archive Space is hosted by Lyrasis, and we transfer access versions of content to there, or it might be access versions going onto some website or other sort of platform. Um, so that's the sort of workflows that we can support in Perpetua, um, and and that seemed to be sort of aligned with some of the discussions that have already happened in Folio around special collections and archives. And there's a really good um, sort of white paper that came out um, from a, uh, a SIG sort of working group uh, 18 months ago that looked at how special collections and archives might be integrated or incorporated into Folio. And that looked at things like archive space and Atom, um, as well as, relevant uh, standards such as ISAG. So we support those things in uh, Perpetua. So we thought, well, can we sort of do a quick and early integration to look at what's practically possible and answer or begin to look at how to answer some questions like how can special collections and archives be discoverable in Folio? How can Folio users seamlessly go between content that's inside Folio and then maybe outside in an external system such as Perpetua? And what would the workflow look like in that sort of case? And that's really what I want to show you um, in the demonstration. So let, let me quit the slides. Um, I, I'll show you what that looks like. So let me show you what we did. Um, before I sort of delve into Folio itself, um, let me pick on just one example of what Perpetua content looks like. So I'm showing here the public face of the records and archives from the University of Westminster, and they are a Perpetua user. And this is the public face of their archive exposed using um, access to memory. Um, as part of Perpetua, and they've got various collections in their um, archives, and you can click on a collection and you can um, sort of navigate through and you can see some digital content, um, and there's some metadata. So this is ISAG uh, metadata about the, uh, their visual arts project as a whole. And then as I pick individual um, items, I sort of go down through the levels of description um, inside their archive, and I can see the, the metadata for this particular item. And indeed, I can pick the item, um, and if I agree to some terms, I can go and look um, you know, the, the full resolution uh, version of the content. Um, 
and, and that content um, has gone through Perpetua. So it was originally uh, digitized posters, and that along with the, the, the scripted metadata was imported into Perpetua and exposed through this front end. And it's got some nice capabilities for doing things like searching, for example. So um, as I start typing in terms, it finds um, matching items, and I can navigate to those and I can see where they are in, in the hierarchy. Um, and indeed, there's sort of a advanced search capabilities. So faceted search and then the ability to create search queries. But this is um, all using ISAG, so as an archival description standard. So this is a little bit different to the way things work in the library world, um, and it's a little bit different to the way you know things look inside Folio. So the question we were looking at was, well, how can you integrate a system like this um, for records or archives into Folio um, so it can be used in a consistent way with all the other sort of things you can find in Folio? Um, so to show you what that looks like, um, I've created another um, sort of simpler collection here. So again, this is um, access to memory as part of Perpetua. And here I've got um, a hierarchical uh, sort of collection, which shows some planets in the solar system. So I've got Milky Way, solar system planets, Earth, Jupiter, Mercury, Mars, and so on, um, and some digital content um, for those uh, things in the solar system, and some pretty basic sort of metadata. Uh, and if you're wondering what the original content looked like that went into Perpetua in the first place, um, this is the set of files. Uh, so there's things like Word documents and PowerPoints and emails and images and video files and audio files and so on. And that all got uploaded into Perpetua, went through the digital preservation and access process that generated these um, web-friendly versions of the content. So things like um, PowerPoints and documents have been converted into PDF with thumbnails so they're easy to view online. So that's, that's my starting point. Um, and what we've done is we've taken Perpetua and we've plugged it into Folio and it looks a bit like this. So this is um, the Edelweiss release of Folio. Um, we've installed it and we're running it on Amazon Web Services. It's the um, core platform, uh, not the complete platform. So it's got a minimal set of applications in there. Um, and one of those applications is the codec search. So codec search allows you to find things across all the content sources in um, uh, Folio. So if I search uh, uh, Africa for Africa, for example, um, and the um, core platform is, comes preloaded with some, uh, some content. Uh, and you search in the codec search, uh, and you get some hits come back. And these hits include some uh, local results. And if I click on one of those, then I'm directed over to the inventory. And I can see the uh, instance and items in the inventory um, as usual. So um, nothing particularly new there, um, just using codec search as a way of finding things uh, the library already has its inventory. If I go back uh, to the codec search, and this time if I search for Jupiter, so this is one of the planets that I've got uh, in Perpetua, um, then I get a whole load of results come back. Um, and these results, it says the source is Perpetua, so what's actually happened is I've typed this search into the Codex Search app, um, and it's gone off and it's searched live against uh, Perpetua, um, which is outside of Folio, and it's find the matching items, um, and they're displayed here um, using the Codex schema. Uh, and I can pick on one of these items, so let's pick this um, uh, item here. Um, and I've now hopped over inside Folio from Codex Search to the Perpetua app. So we've created an app inside Folio, which is able to display um, a simple view of results from um, special collections and archives. So here, 
um, I've got ISAG metadata for my matching um, item and a little thumbnail so you can see I get a preview of it and I've got a URL that I can click on and if I click on that URL then I am transferred over to Perpetua as an external application and um, so I'm outside of Folio now um, and I can see exactly where that match um, has taken place within the context of the overall um, collection. Uh, and that, that's quite important for spe special collections and archives because there's a lot of that sort of effort goes into curating these things and organizing and arranging content. So I can see the match in context and I can see the metadata um, in ISAG and I can actually use this message so I could go start um, searching and navigating for similar things within Perpetua. And I can also go through and I can open up and I can see the, the full item. So I've sort of seamlessly been transferred from inside Folio to outside of Folio to, to see items that match. Uh, and when I did that search, that was all um, sort of live searching against Perpetua. Uh, and that's actually quite useful. Um, so if I do another search, and this time I'm going to search for um, all across all fields not just titles so if i search for Vo oh, if i could spell that properly voyager i do another search um, and this does a live search against um, perpetua for anything in perpetua that matches voyager and i, I get some um some matches back um, and here's one of them but you see it's got metadata but um, none of that metadata included the word voyager the way it actually matched is because inside um, this document, um, somewhere in here, just here, because I've done this search before and I know exactly where it is, there's the term Voyager. So Perpetua has got a full text index of content um, and Folio is able to search that um, full text index as well as uh, search the metadata fields. Uh, and that can be, really useful um, in a special collection and archive context because not all content that archives have especially digital content has got extensive metadata or has been fully catalogued so i'll give you um, one final example uh, and that's searching an email archive um, so I showed you a sort of example with some planets and Jupiter and that sort of thing. I actually have some other content loaded into Perpetua as well. And that's some um, email archive content from um, Enron. And they were forced to make all their email um, PST files public. Uh, and we've loaded some of those into Perpetua. So if I search for oil, um, as you would with Enron, um, that goes out and it searches Perpetua and it comes back with a whole load of results. Um, and just as before, I can click on one of these results um, and here's a thumbnail of the email content and I can click on the item and I get transferred over to Perpetua. And here's the email archive of Kimberly Watson um, from her time at uh, Enron, and you can see the sort of hierarchical structure of a uh, email, including all the different folders she's got. Um, and then down here, there's a matching email uh, that this is here, and I can open it up and I can look at it, and somewhere in here will be the word um, oil. And that's, in fact, it's just there. Um, so what I've done is um, I've been able to find things in. Um, Folio um, without needing any metadata directly on uh, stuff in the, in the archive. And that goes as far in Perpetua as, you know, we extract out the uh, attachments um, from emails. Um, we put those through our preservation and access process. Um, so again, that's full text index. So this um, attachment is oh, it's way down here somewhere. Uh, there it is. Uh, it's an attachment to an email and we've converted the original Word document from 10, 15 years ago into a PDF so it can be viewed online and that's been full text indexed. Um, and, and all of that has now become available in, inside Folio. 
so through the codex search and this live searching approach and um, we've got quite a powerful way to find things not just that's already inside folio for example in the inventory but also outside of folio um, in the external you know, in our external perpetua application right so um, that hopefully gives you a better idea of um, what I mean by integrating Perpetua into Folio. Um, let me go back to the slides just for a second. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we did that um, and some of the questions that have arisen, um, and I've got plenty. So uh, the way we did it was by mapping the Folio codex to the metadata schema we use in Perpetua for special collections and archives. So inside Folio, you've got the codex um, and its schema, and then in Perpetua for special collections and archives, we've got ISAG, and we've mapped some of the fields between the two, which means you can search in Folio against the codex, which is common to everything in Folio, um, but that actually um, maps the things using ISAG um, in Perpetua, or it could be some other schema. It might be data site for, for scholarly sort of outputs and research data. Um, and th this is sort of behind the scenes what, what actually happened when I did that demo. So I started as a user and I did a codex search and I said, I want to find Jupyter stuff and codex search. So I sort of asked its mates, every, it said, you know, who knows about um, being able to find things? Uh, and it got the inventory to look in its local database. Um, if I'd had the knowledge base app installed, then it would have gone out and looked for matching items as well. For example, um, going out to EBSCO's databases. Um, and in this case, you know, the Perpetua app inside Folio knows how to talk to Perpetua as an external system. And it asked it um, for matching things on Jupyter. And then inside Folio, you know, anything that came back from the inventory, knowledge base, or Perpetua were then assembled into a result set that was presented to me as a user. And then when I clicked on Jupyter as one of the, well, that Jupyter image as one of the matching results, then the Perpetua app inside Folio went back to Perpetua and said, hey, give me all the details for that matching image, and then presented um, me as a Folio user with that sort of record of ISAG metadata fields on it and the thumbnail and the URL. And then finally, when I clicked that URL, I was transferred out to the Perpetua um, user interface and to see the item in context and in full detail uh, and this uh, you know is, is a really powerful model of being able to do searches across multiple um, applications both with internal content inside folio and, and external content as well and, and perpetua i think it, it's it's one example of how to integrate external applications into folio and you know, as Ipsco keep telling me, and I, I should stress, it's the first external application to be integrated, but I don't think it will be the last. Um, I mean, Folio is great in having an open data model, an open API, open source, and that really made the integration quite easy. Um, and it does mean through this sort of integration, then for Folio, I think, potentially has the place to provide a, a single point to search across a whole library of state. So, I mean, we certainly see in libraries that it can be, you know, separate stovepipe systems. You know, there's archive, special collections archives over in one place. There's, you know, research data institutional repositories in another place. And there's core library systems in another place, and they've got different um, tools, different standards, different people, and they don't necessarily connect together as they, they might do. Um, so Folio, I think, is a great opportunity to, to pull some of those content sources uh, together. Um, and indeed, that's, that's one of the things that we'll be looking at uh, is how you can discover things through Folio, um, but then be transferred across to the right or the most appropriate external system when it comes to um, accessing uh, that content. Um, so 
I mean, we've we did we've done this initial integration and it would be great to have um, feedback and suggestions on what looks good and what doesn't. I mean, we've certainly got some questions ourselves. Um, so some of the things that, you know, we've been thinking about or would like to have feedback on are, well, what schemas should be used when you're displaying external content within Folio? So, I mean, I showed some ISAG metadata inside Folio for a matching item in a special collection and archive. Is that the right thing to do? Um, I don't know. Um, should we have stuck to just the mapping to the codex and only presented um, codex fields inside Folio? And then any sort of ISAG specific stuff would only be seen by the user when they moved outside of Folio into this into Perpetua's external application. Um, but that can be a bit tricky. That means that there'd be a limited ability to see things inside Folio um, because you know, the, the codex um, core model um, doesn't necessarily align that well to things like ISAG. And because we had to do a mapping, um, where should that mapping live? I mean, we're not the only solution that supports ISAG or you know, archive. So if someone else came along and they wanted to integrate their application with the same metadata schema, um, would they have to do their own crosswalk or could there be a sort of a common crosswalk that we all share? Um, and then, you know, what sort of previews should be available for digital content inside Folio. I mean, I showed some thumbnails and some images, that's easy. Um, but archives have a whole range of different content types. So video, audio, 3D, geospatial data, websites, email, and the rest. Now, should those be sort of summarized or viewable inside Folio? Um, I don't know. Um, and then comes the question of, well, we integrated with Codex Search, but are there other ways to do the same sort of thing? Um, or could other uh, Folio applications come into play? So could we have added items in Perpetua to the Folio inventory? I mean, on one hand, it's just stuff that's all owned and managed by the library. So why treat special collections differently from um, core content? But then that would mean, you know, would inventory need to support both archiving and library standards? Um, and that could make things a bit more complicated. Um, and maybe there's a role for circulation. Um, and I was discussing this with um, Lisa from Chalmers at a, an event we were both at in London yesterday. I mean, what, what does it mean if you've got you know, physical things in an archive like manuscripts or, or artifacts? Um, what circulation in that context could it be for example you know uh, the rather than loaning something out you actually have to book an appointment to go and view a, a physical thing in the archive um, because it's a limited resource um, and, and maybe there's a role for acquisitions too um, so archives don't necessarily buy things in the same way that libraries might buy you know books or subscriptions um, but things can be donated and there are things like accession records and donor agreements. So, you know, is that something where acquisitions uh, could be used? So lots of questions, lots of thoughts, um, as well as certainly how we could, you know, do more. I mean, so I showed the simple case of stuff's been put into Perpetua, we at least make that discoverable in Folio. But are there other things that we could do? So some of the digital preservation and safeguarding services we have in Perpetua, could we expose those in Folio? So you could upload digital content to Folio and then transfer it over to Perpetua for safekeeping. So lots of other integration work that could be done. Uh, so where are we now? Well, yeah, feedback discussions will be great. Um, always keen to, to learn more uh, about how we could do things better or differently. Uh, certainly want to make this um, thing that I've shown you a public demonstrator so other people can play with it um, and you know I want to release the integration at least as, as open source and we've been busy already presenting and promoting both Folio and Perpetua um, so there's a great event in, in London just yesterday um, where we were um, presenting the integration I've shown you um, and extolling the, the virtues of Folio and its open source approach. And there's loads of cool stuff that we, we want to do as well. Um, I should probably stop there. I mean, I think we're going to take questions at the end. Um, 
Uh, and yeah, and if I hadn't mentioned it enough times already, um, Perpetua is the first third party app to be integrated into Folio, and we're really proud and, and happy to have done so. And hopefully it's really interesting to the community too. Uh, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I can confidently speak for the community that this is fascinating, and I'm delighted that you have asked us questions. And just as a reminder, yes, please, Go ahead, if you have questions uh, specifically for Matthew, go, you can go ahead and enter them in the Q&A and I'll make sure that we get to them after Harry has given us an update on the roadmap. All right, hello everyone. And hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yes, we can. All right. So again, I'm Harry Kaplanian. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this should be relatively quick. Um, so nothing really to the level of detail like you've just seen, but certainly an overview. So real quick, Matthew stated multiple times Folio is a platform. And well, Folio is a platform. And with that platform comes certain advantages. One of them being um, this idea of open innovation. Folio is open source. The code is fully available. And because of that, organizations like Archivum can go in and start to integrate, start to work, start to modify, start to improve. It's also based on microservices. So we're no longer constrained by these legacy monolithic software systems that we've had to deal with in the past. Um, Folio is made up of a series of um, apps, systems, and services, and they're all interchangeable. Um, you only need the use, you only need to install and use the ones that are useful to you, which is what we just saw with Archivum. They use a subset of the functionality that was available in Folio. Um, this is also kind of interesting because this implies uh, when, let's say, a particular app gets old. Um, you should be able to upgrade it. You should be able to create a new one, but even better, we should be able to choose. And so Folio, um, as far as we know now, for example, is the first system that has multiple ERMs. Um, relatively soon, we expect multiple cataloging tools as well, and libraries get to choose the tools that are best for them. And so ultimately, you know, those first two combined provide really a vibrant ecosystem where we have partners, where we have libraries, where we have individuals creating and contributing, while at the same time giving libraries choice in terms of who they choose to work with, who they might choose to hire to maybe build certain pieces, or maybe actually, you know, which developers on staff might they be able to assign to really build that future app that helps lead that library to the future that they see for themselves. Foley itself is also designed to support additional future and current, frankly, metadata formats without forcing a rewrite of the system. And so right now we are focused on Mark. Um, it Folio also has an internal uh, inventory record structure that it uses and maintains as well. Um, but we do know there are other organizations and libraries that are now starting to look at Folio as a platform to experiment with linked data and other metadata formats that are used in other parts of the world as well. Folio also supports multiple knowledge bases and can actually support them simultaneously. Um, Folio right now is the only system that I know of that can actually support two knowledge bases for e-resources, and we expect soon there'll be more than that as well. Um, and then Folio really is the one system out there that can really pull in all the different resources that the library manages in one place, whether it be print, electronic, music, whatever the case may be, you should be able to manage it all in one place without using, for example, a separate ERM system along with your catalog system and so on. It should be all in one place. And that's what Folio provides. Folio, again, as a platform, um, we do have a series of what we call core Folio library applications 
which represent basics like cataloging, resource management for both electronics and print, circulation, acquisitions, and there's quite a few others. And those core apps come with the system to make it useful as quickly and as soon as possible. But these apps are built upon what we call the folio gateway, or which is called Okapi. And this is really the switchboard that all the different services, microservices are able to plug into and communicate with each other. And we also have a common UI toolkit, which is called Stripes. So for anyone that wants to, they can come in, build an application and have it look and appear just like Folio does, just as Archivum showed us a little while ago. And then because it is open and because it is a platform, it really allows extensibility in pretty much any direction that any library would ever need. And so there is, for example, union catalog functionality being built. Um, we, I think, fair to say we saw an example of digital repositories today. Um, there's different discovery systems that libraries have a choice of as well. And we know there's certainly many additional third party applications that are going to become available relatively soon as well. So the folio ecosystem and platform is expanding. So Folios is li Folio is live. Um, we've said this before in a previous presentation, I believe in November, uh, but Chalmers, of, Chalmers University of Sweden is the first library to run Folio. Their actual operations are running with Folio. They've shut down their old system. And for ERM functionality, they're using Folio's e-holdings license and agreements applications. And again, what's really special about this those ERM applications were not actually built by a single company or organization. Multiple organizations were involved in delivering those pieces. The circulation apps and Folio circulation doesn't exist as a single monolithic app. It's actually a series of apps. So they're using check-in, check-out requests. Um, they're using inventory and the receiving features of inventory as well. Patron management, as you would expect. And they're using orders and organization applications, uh, which are part of the acquisition suite of tools that are available in Folio as well. And they've also been able to integrate. And so Folio is connected to their national union catalog. Uh, they do all their cataloging at the national union catalog level. And once the record is complete, a record is automatically sent to Folio where it appears in Folio's inventory. Um, it's working with all their self-check equipment via SIP2 their scanners, and in this case, they happen to be using EDS as their discovery service, and they've been live since the end of September last year. In addition, we've got some additional um, round one implementations as well. Um, in January, uh, Cornell went live with Folio's ERM, as did Missouri State. And then uh, we also have um, ZBW um, in Germany, and they're in the process of adopting Folio ERM. We expect them to be live at the end of Q1. We're also preparing for a group of what we call our round two early adopters. And there's a target date of around mid 2020. Um, that can mean any number of things. Um, some of them are gonna try and start their migration earlier. Some might have to be just a little bit later. Um, but it's hard to actually apply an exact date to these things. Um, what's important is roughly the middle of the year, we expect the next round of libraries to start to go live. And these libraries are currently testing with actual library data, um, their own library data. Um, they're building their implementation plans, uh, reviewing workflows, and they either do this by themselves or in um, many cases, they're doing it with a vendor that they choose to work with. And so we have Simmons University, Warner University, Missouri State, um, University of Leipzig, which will focus on ERM and acquisitions where the rest are looking to adopt the full system. And then um, in Bremen, we have uh, the State and University Library of Bremen um, that will be adopting ERM as well. And these are all currently in progress. To help uh, get these libraries up and running, um, as I mentioned, they have been testing with actual library data. And as any library starts to take a look, especially at brand new code, um, they start to notice either certain features that either don't quite 
do what they need to have done to fully run the li library, um, or sometimes they maybe find defects, issues, what have you. And so we've been focusing on these. And we ran through a round of these when Chalmers went live and then um, with uh, Cornell and Missouri State with ERM. And we're, in addition to handling any issues that pop up from those, we're also focusing on the issues that have been identified with these libraries as well. And so the feature improvements that we're really focusing on right now are for both um, Folio's import abilities, export abilities, and mark editing abilities, in addition to, frankly, you know, updates across the board to all features. We also have a group that now we're identifying as round three. And we expect these to start late in 2020 to early 2021. And again, they are actually testing as well um, with live systems. But we've got the uh, Wentworth Institute of Technology here in Massachusetts, Lehigh University, University of Alabama, and then GBV, um, who is looking to adopt everything but circulation at this point in time. Um, of course, you know, we're predicting the future here. So, you know, there may be some changes. There may be some additional libraries that join that group. Some may make some decisions to postpone as well. Um, GBV may decide to adopt the entire system. We shall see. And then we have what we're calling round four. And most likely these will go live mid 2021. And this represents University of Chicago, Duke University, the five colleges consortia, Texas A&M and Cornell University for the rest of Folio outside of what is ERM. So Folio's uh, roadmap um, or milestones in terms of uh, what the community is aiming for. Um, as I mentioned um, last year, both through Q3 and Q4, we were really focused on what were really the round one libraries. So what did Chalmers need? And actually, uh, what did Cornell um, and Missouri State need to get their first systems up and running? But then starting in Q4 and into Q1, um, a shift started to occur um, where we're starting to focus on the round two library needs. And so the integrations that they need any reporting and analytics that they need. Um, course reserves started um, in Q4 and work is ongoing now currently in Q1. Um, improvements were needed in fund management for acquisitions. Um, up until this point in time, there really hasn't been an easy way to upgrade from the different versions from Folio. So there's been um, an extra effort to try and build the upgrade tools to make this e easy and seamless as possible. And just in general, when you develop, you know, when organizations and people actually use software despite your best intentions, there are often surprises. And so we're working on, of course, improving those. And also, you know, oftentimes during development environment, again, you tend to, um, predict as best you can, but it's the best you can, it's an estimate. And so there's typically some spillover as well. And that's some of what we've seen in Q4, and we certainly see it in Q1. As I mentioned earlier, um, in Q1, again, focusing on that round two set of libraries, uh, the migration and export features and um, import features that they need, mark editing, we've also been working on improving searching, and again, just general improvements across the board. Um, just because these are listed here doesn't imply work everywhere else has stopped. Um, work continues across the board. And then uh, we're looking at Q2. Um, we're ideally near the end of Q2. Those round two libraries actually start to implement. And then starting to look at Q3, where we continue to focus and update based on what we learn from the feedback of those round two libraries. Um, but in addition, starting to shift yet again to start to take a look at what is it the round three early adopters need? What are those features that they're going to require? And we believe we know what these are. Um, all these libraries have gone through prioritization exercises, looking at the folio backlog and trying to, you know, clearly articulate what are the things that they believe they need. 
while at the same time, all these libraries are actually using and testing the software with their data, which is critically important because there's really no better way to learn about the software. And sometimes you find features that you thought you absolutely positively had to have. You don't need so much anymore because it turns out the new software has different ways of accomplishing that work. But then you also find in some cases there are some misses. And so again, we're you know, learning and understanding all of these, scheduling and prioritizing all of these and getting these features built. And so really, you know, there's overlap across all of these as well, which I think is fairly easy to see here in the Q3. We're referring to both round two and round three libraries. And again, that's natural. And then as we look into Q4, um, again, more actively starting to work on all those features that are needed for Q3 so they can start their adoptions starting in Q4 and onward, and then starting to look at as well what we need for Q4 as well. The bottom here, try to you know better articulate roughly where the round one early adopters stand, the round two and the round three and later are. And again, there's really more overlap than those little colored bars at the bottom show. Another thing, just a reminder, um, behind this chart, we've got this large bluish triangle sitting on its side uh, that represents the cone of uncertainty. And this happens in every project, frankly, whether it's software or anything else for that matter. Of course, the things that you've done, you know absolutely what you've done. The pieces of the project that you're actually working on currently, you've got a pretty good idea about what you're going to be able to deliver and what you're not. The surprises tend to be minimal. But as you start to look further and further out in the future, that picture becomes more and more hazy, which of course explains why when we look at Q4 2020 here, we don't see the list of bullet points anywhere like we see in the other ones. It's a little bit far out. Again, we do have some fairly extensive documentation that points us to exactly what we want to build here, and we're assuming that's what we're going to do, but I think it's also safe to assume there's going to be changes. So Edelweiss, which is the latest release, released January 10th um, of this year. And there are many more features and updates and improvements than what are listed here. But these are some of sort of the notable big ones. Um, and, you know, in agreements, the ability, uh, we've added change tracking, amendments, PDA agreements, and more. Um, for acquisitions, invoice processing, um, we've had to um, restructure um, uh, refactor the financial structures. That work is complete. We've also created the ability um, for a library to set up acquisitions units and assign work um, or rather budgets to particular acquisitions units. Um, there's also um, uh, the first um, part of the batch import feature has become available, which gives you action profiles. There's interactive logs, um, the ability to create uh, human readable identifiers and more. Um, circulation now has shelving location rule cool uh, shelving location rules. There have been uh, many improvements to the requests functionality. Lost items functionality is added in transit. Uh, anonymization has been improved. Permissions have been improved and now multi-line notifications to users as well. Um, for uh, ERM notes and file import, inventory, um, call numbers, proceeding, succeeding, ti uh, succeeding titles. Um, NSIP is now available um, for check-in, check-out, um, look-up user, and accept items. And this is important for the integration of external ILL systems. We see basic functionality for course reserves and substantial improvements in the re receiving process in Folio as well. And again, a lot of this comes from libraries testing and using the system. And that's it. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions if anyone has any. Yes, at this point, anyone who has questions, please type them into the Q&A or you can use the chat feature in Zoom. And questions for either of our presenters, either Harry or Matthew, or both, if you have something that you'd like to hear from both of them on. But, okay. Oh, where can I find course reserves in Edelweiss? 
So if course reserves are installed, um, you would simply see the app across the top in the menu. Um, if it's not, um, have a quick discussion with whoever um, it is you're working with and um, they should be able to set that up for you. Might it be in the drop down rather than along the top, depending on how many other apps? It could be. It could very well be. Okay, there's another. Oh, ah. We are talking about uh, doing a forum on course reserves. So. And course reserves has also been an area of um, very active development. So um, it could also be when the system was set up, it might not have been quite ready, but that can certainly be set up. And if, if there aren't burning questions coming in right away, I'm wondering, Matthew, if you would mind sharing if we could go back to your slides to some of the questions you had for the community uh, because I personally found those very interesting. Um, uh, yeah, sure. I'm more than happy yeah. to circulate the slides and uh, yeah, any feedback on the questions would be brilliant. Yeah. Would you be able to quickly pull up those three pages now? Uh, yeah, I can probably help. Um, <laughs> any one of them just to, to remind <laughs> us um, uh, well, while you're seeing if you can do that my my folio home is is um, in metadata management which is focused on on inventory as well as some other apps so i'm very interested in some of the questions around potential in integration with inventory and circulation some of the use cases we've talked about with specifically with special collections and archival materials involve the need to even though organizations aren't circulating these collections they need to use circulation like features for patrons to request them or for them to be able to physically track them and i'm wondering if you have thoughts about that or does that just bring up more questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I kind of agree. I guess it's a question of, I mean, how much management happens inside Folio in one place versus how much management happens, you know, outside in dedicated applications that are designed for that sort of thing. So I suppose for things like archives, um, there are already archive management systems or um, you know, museum systems that are designed and built for managing those sort of workflows and those processes. So do you replicate some of that inside Folio or do you sort of provide hooks from Folio into those external systems? I, I, I don't know at this stage. I think it's a really interesting question. Well, I would, I would love to extend an invitation to you to join us at a future metadata management meeting because there are a number of metadata management sub subject matter experts who are involved with archival description and or cataloging of rare materials and have yeah, lots cool. of would love to. Oh, wonderful. Are there, please, if anybody else watching has questions, please do enter them in chat or Q&A. And I'll give people one more moment to do so. I am not, I'm not seeing any other questions, which means that you both gave very thorough presentations. So this concludes today's Folio Forum on Perpetua's integration with Folio and the roadmap update. You can continue this conversation at the Folio discussion website, which is discuss.folio.org and on Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forum. The recording of today's forum will be posted soon to the Open Library Foundation's YouTube channel. And if you're not already subscribed to that channel, you can go to YouTube and search for Open Library Foundation. If you have feedback on this forum or you have an idea for a future forum, please contact the, fo the forum facilitators at facilitators at 
olay-lists.openlibraryfoundation.org. Thank you very much to Harry and Matthew and to everybody who participated by asking questions and adding comments. And thank you, everyone. No, thank you very much as well.